He's not asking to expand Tika. He's asking to kill our side of the industry. Not kill, appropriate. Appropriate, yes. Hi everybody, Lucas from Hometown Hero here with Cynthia Cabrera. And today we're gonna to do part two of our video regarding the Senate committee hearing. If you haven't seen the first video, strongly encourage you to go watch it, but you don't really necessarily need to have watched that to watch this video. Uh, my name is Nico Richardson and I am the CEO and I'm here representing Texas Original Compassion and Cultivation. Many hemp products are highly intoxicating, more potent than what's offered in the medical CUP program here and dangerously under-regulated. Under the hemp industry in Texas is regulated, heavily regulated, so much so that they passed a bill just to regulate it and there's a state agency that's responsible and has a whole program for regulating the entire industry. Again, so it's really easy for people to cast dispersions or misinformation, and you know, misinformation is like a trigger word these days, but this is actual misinformation. And the legislators, at least a few of them that are on this committee, voted for that bill that instructed dishes to come up with regulations so they know it's regulated. So he's literally just lying to the committee. He's like out and out well, lying. the committee knows that it's regulated as well. Everybody, That's what I'm everybody saying. Everybody involved right. here knows that there but are regulations. But he's okay right sitting up there and lying and saying it's not regulated. An example of this would be uh, a medical uh, ma marijuana gummy from our program would be one gram and have a 10 milligram dose in it. Do you think he is selectively referring to a product or on purpose not mentioning that they have a 30 milligram? There's no way he doesn't know what products they make. So he's being very selective about what information no, he shares. Every single person that talked during the committee hearing in favor of the teacup program, which was all of them, all the experts, um, were very selective in what they spoke about. It was pretty obvious. Well, you know, it just it rubs me the wrong way when a monopolist, you know, edits information. Well, it, it's disingenuous. It is disingenuous. There are at least 10 intoxicating cannabinoids that we know of today, and only one is regulated in Texas currently, which is Delta 9 THC. All of the THCs are regulated, and they're regulated from the Farm Bill. It's all encompassing. Delta 9 is the one that's specifically called out in regards to a weight capacity, right? It's 0.3% Delta 9 THC by dry weight basis. But to say that no other hemp cannabinoid or THC is regulated is, is incorrect. It's all tied into the regulation through the Farm Bill. I mean, I think, I think it's fair to say that this is a self-serving testimony and everything we listen to is going to be based on well, let's be clear. I mean, the, the Senate, this is a Senate committee hearing that is based on the lieutenant governor's interim charges, and he literally wants to get rid of an, our entire industry. So this is the committee that was tasked with essentially seeing that that happens, right? Correct. So, I mean, it's not surprising that this, this expert panel, all of the experts were heavily stacked against us. We didn't get an expert slot. We were supposed to go at 9 a.m. <laughs> I got to talk at 8 30 p.m. I was there for 12 hours. Yeah, I went like half an hour after you. But I mean, there's always a part of me that likes to think that people are good and people have good intentions or whatever, but this entire testimony is set up to be self-serving. And this is this stems from the MSOs, right? Like this is an obvious play by the MSOs and by people that come from MSOs to control the Texas cannabis market. This is the most recent loophole molecule it's marketed as hemp. Loophole word again. Um, you will continue to hear all of our adversaries and opposition use that word loophole. It, there is no loophole. The federal farm bill is very explicitly clear on what it legalizes. And Texas subsequently adopted those same rules with 1325 and created some of their own. But there is no loophole. This has been a government approved thing and fully legal. And the 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 reason the marijuana industry is using the word loophole, and I'll let you touch on this, is essentially they have no other strategy to go against us, right? So they're, they're trying to say that we're a loophole, and that's their, their large strategy to convince the politicians to get rid of us. But there is no loophole. This has been very clear since the beginning. I think I said last week that loophole is the new word that I hate. Yeah, I don't like that word. This downward tre trend in Texas, grown hemp is partly due, we believe at least, to the fact that Texas products cannot be sold as smokable hemp. So this is part of the original HB 1325 regulation where they said that smokable products can't be manufactured within the state. 
So I, I believe that's a bad piece of, of, of the bill, right? HB 1325, and it should be fixed because we're taking business that could be in Texas and being part of Texas and generating tax revenue, generating jobs, and we're forcing it to go out of state. That doesn't make any sense. I'll take it up a level higher. And there's been a court case around that too within yes. Texas. Yes, yes. I think it was Crown Distribution. Whatever happened with that? They lost in the Supreme Court, Texas Supreme Court. Okay. Well, I'll take it up another level. He says that he thinks that the acreage of hemp farmed has gone down because of the smokable ban. I disagree. I think the acreage has gone down because farmers are disincentivized because we are under threat every legislative session. So if you're a yeah, farmer, you go yeah, go back to cotton or by tomatoes. The time, by the time the crop is ready to harvest, the legislative could have changed. Yeah, I mean, if I'm right, a farmer, yeah. this, this product doesn't make so sense. So I don't agree that it's the smokable thing, that that's not the issue, because you can export it and then bring it right back into the state and sell it. So that's not it. It's all the uh, business instability. It doesn't. It's not feasible for farmers to always be on the edge of their seats, wondering if they're going to be able to yeah, sell a crop. You can't do business that way. Right. The acreage of hemp grown in Texas reached its zenith in 2021. Yet the number of hemp retail registrations has grown from the numbers we have are 1,948 in 2020 to over 7,000 most recently in 2024. He acts like there's a correlation. He says it like this is like a big reveal. What's, what's the big reveal? We know why acreage farmed is going down, and we know that this is a very good market, and so the market has grown. What, what's the big reveal here? To put that in perspective, California's regulated marijuana industry only has about 1,650 retail licenses in the entire state of California. He says California's regulated market He's talking about marijuana. Marijuana is federally illegal. States went off on their own and regulated something. It doesn't mean that because California regulated marijuana that suddenly it's a legal product. And it doesn't mean that hemp products are thereby unregulated. With imported hemp from out of state is that our state regulators have no jurisdiction over out of state labs and therefore no ability to verify test results. They don't need jurisdiction over out-of-state labs to send it to a lab and test it. Correct. Texas has multiple certified labs that, that anybody can use. That so in the state even uses them, right? Correct. We use one of the same labs that the state uses. Correct. They have the ability to go take products and send to these labs. They have done that with our products numerous times. So it's very disingenuous to say that the state doesn't have the ability to test these products. Yeah. They do and they actively do. <laughs> they don't have authority over an outside you know, state lab that's not in this state, but they can send it to any, they can take a sample and send it to any lab to test. What is listed on those out-of-state certificates of analysis rarely comports to what's actually in the product from what we've seen. From what they've seen, and again, zero evidence. He doesn't have two different COAs to compare. He doesn't have a product that he you know, didn't match up, nothing. So he's just saying whatever he wants to say in support of his business with zero evidence. They need to provide the COA if asked by the Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, Everybody has to provide a COA if asked by the department. Well, the Texas regulations require you to have a COA link on your packaging. So there are no Again, products without COAs. Correct, and he's acting like they're under this undue burden where they have to produce the COA. Everybody has to have a COA. Yeah, this is We're all common. in the same Everybody boat. Has to. Yeah. And with more than 7,000 retailers and thousands of out-of-state products being shipped into Texas every day, uh, it's near impossible to confirm the accuracy of out-of-state lab results. And yet he speaks with so much authority. Well, they test our products. They so, do. I mean, we know this. They have the ability yeah. to test. By comparison, under the CUP, licenses must test every single batch of medicine and provide those results to the DPS every single month on monthly inspections. Ooh well, that's that's regulations that they have the ability to fix. So there are some comments made on regards to the teacup program and regulations being burdensome and possibly changing those. Uh, these groups have the ability to change these regulations. If they wanted to, they would. The reason they aren't, the regulations and the way that the teacup program is set up it's got massive barriers to entry. We looked at the program when they first launched it, the details of it, and we estimated it was somewhere between 10 and $15 million 
to get a business to the point where it could actually apply and get approved. That's, that's out the gate before you've had a single sale. And these regulations that he's arguing about, that's what they signed up for. They agreed to that. So how is it suddenly a different industry's fault yeah. that they signed up for something they don't like? Well, those are, those are their barriers to entry. It's the reason there's only one license holder. Yeah, so he wants it both ways. Or one active license uh, user. There's more than one holder. From what we can tell, I think there's three. They have the fifth license, but I, I still am unsure who all, they, who all has them. Well, the number of marijuana lobbyists that are registered for this legislative year would indicate that there are other MSOs trying to get that program expanded, which is not gonna make this dude happy. And they won't make it public. There are six lobbyists that I've been able to identify that have been retained by marijuana MSOs. So it's, it's important to understand, in context of the volume of what's at stake with the Texas, if you wanna call it marijuana or cannabis, there's, there's, there are different components of it, but on the legal market side, California is arguably the largest. If you look at alcohol consumption, California is the largest in the country. By alcohol consumption, Texas is number two and Florida's number three. Is I would that argue- based on population? It's, it's just total consumption, just it's gallons? not per capita. It's just straight gallons. So I would argue hard that Texas has the potential to be number two in the country in cannabis consumption, and that's why all the MSOs are now sniffing around Texas and trying to figure this out. Is, this is Texas original, right? Is there right. a California original? Or is this their only? This is, as far as I know, this is their only entity. Now, in terms of who owns equity in this company, I have no idea. I haven't been able to figure that out. So it's, it's so it could be MSOs, it could be, there could be politicians, we don't know. So let's pretend that this is the only state where they're operating. Correct. They're trying to leverage a regulatory capture. They're trying to leverage the state, the legislature, so that they're the only possible avenue and for- control the entire market. Cannabis, anything, yeah. yes. And so this is why they're digging in so hard, because it's not like they have another state and to fall back on. And they're bringing lobbyists, and they're bringing in other MSOs. There's, there's a lot at stake in Texas. There is. Yeah. The potential of Texas. Yeah. Patients are leaving our medical system now for unregulated products. So. They're not unregulated. They're federally legal. There are regulations in the state of Texas, and you would think that somebody who took a company public would do a little bit of basic research. Well, he knows he knows what he's saying, and he knows what he's doing. I know, it's just so irritating. And this is why I don't like the large MSOs, and this is why I, I tend to shit on them quite a bit, because they do stuff like this. These are not the people that were pro-marijuana, pro-cannabis, when we were growing up, right? Like, these are not the Jack Herrera's. These are not the people that are trying to serve people. These are the people that are trying to make money on these products and don't give a shit about whether or not people have access to them. Their gummies are $100 a bag for gummies, and it, like it, it's, it, it doesn't make sense. Well, so just to go back for a minute, he talked about the California market, right? And he said that the California market only has 1,600 dispensaries, right? That's what he said? Yeah. Okay. What he neglected to mention is that California essentially banned hemp products because that's what happens in, in states where uh, rec marijuana exists. Because it impacts the tax revenue. Well, it impacts the tax revenue, and these folks don't like competition. Yes. They don't like competition, so in the states right. where recreational is legal, they also manage to take out hemp products because they don't want to have to deal with any competition. God forbid that consumers should make their own choice. So he neglects to mention that. He also neglects to mention how crappy the California marijuana market is. Yeah, and let's touch on that for a second. So uh, we'll, we'll pop an article up as a source, but the state of California served weed maps in 2024 with a cease and desist because they had more illegal dispensaries than legal dispensaries, and the only way they could figure out how to impact them was to try and remove them from weed maps. They literally couldn't enforce it. So the vast, let's be clear here, the vast majority of dispensaries in California as of 2024 were illegal. They, the California uh, state asked weed maps to remove 2,700 dispensaries, right? These are illegal businesses. They theoretically aren't paying taxes. And so California, the, by over-regulating their marijuana market, they've essentially handed it to illegal business operations, right? And that's where you start to get weird stuff involved. We're not an illegal market. They're trying to draw, draw parallels to what we do to the illegal California market, and what we do is not illegal. So over-regulation, like prohibition, 
doesn't work, mm -hmm. right? And that's what's happening in California. And he also doesn't mention that there's probably, oh, maybe he did, weed coming in from California because they can't sell it. All that, yeah. the only way these businesses can stay in business in California is that they ship stuff out the back door and export it to another state. Yeah. He doesn't mention that. My understanding is that in, in most states, from what I understand, there's a lot of products sold on the illicit market because the overburdensome regulations don't allow these businesses to make money. So now they're literally turning into criminals to make sure that they're, they can feed their families and keep their employees because of overregulation. Overregulation, which is what is happening in Texas with the marijuana market, because there's only one active license holder, you're essentially, if, if they get rid of the hemp industry in Texas, where is all this business gonna go? It's not gonna go to that market. No. It's gonna go to the drugs coming in from Mexico. There's gonna be more drugs brought in from other states. Like this, this is not going to go away. So over-regulating and removing a thriving industry within Texas, you're asking for criminal elements to come in and, and take their spot. So if I hear what you're saying, Texas Original is asking the cartel to move into Texas. 100% by if you do what is being requested by the politicians and by Teacup and, and Texas Originals, if you do that, you are embracing a massive criminal element that is going to come in and take the place. Unfortunately, starting in 2022 and rapidly accelerating in 2023, we have seen our active patient base dramatically decline, basically cut in half. Uh, this trend is perfectly juxtaposed with the exponential increase in recreational hemp licenses across the state. Wait, <laughs> recreational <laughs> hemp licenses? Where do I get that? I want a recreational he hemp may be license. He's smoking his own product. I, I don't know. Who do I contact to get that license? I I mean, when did recreational whatever become legal in the state? And again, I just want to say whoever helped him craft his testimony is very good because this word salad, it packs the right trigger words and it, it just, you know, it shapes it in such a way, you know, no evidence, just, you know, okay. I've said it. I didn't say anything, but you know what I mean. When we ask our patients and doctors their reasons for leaving the program, one of the most prevalent answers we receive is that patients are still consuming marijuana, but they're doing it from a cheaper source. Than see my drink here? You see this? Yeah. Okay. So pretend that Red Bull didn't like Celsius and they're like, people are not drinking Red Bull because they're drinking Celsius. You need to shut Celsius down. On what planet does an argument like that ever hold water? He's upset that patients are leaving because they found another product that they like better that is less expensive. More accessible. More accessible. We're talking about adults here. It's and not hurting people. It's not hurting people. And he's upset that people are making their own choices. He wants a captive audience. He wants hostages that can only go through him. 80% of our patients leave the compassionate use program after one year. So that's our churn rate. If 90% of your customers are leaving within 12 months, there is a fundamental flaw in what you are doing. Also, earlier he said that they've lost 50% of their business. So how is it only 50% if 90% leave every year? There are three primary reasons we see. One is accessibility. <laughs> the regulatory burden has greatly hampered accessibility in the CUP. CUP licenses can only store inventory at one single lo location in the state of Texas. I have a question. You said they must be like 50, 60 million dollars into this, tens of millions of dollars yeah, into this little it's venture. It's highly expensive. Okay. Do you think they did any math when they read what the proposal was for regulation and we're like, yeah, we can't make any money with that. Yeah, there's reason nobody else is doing it. Right, how is that our fault? Yeah, it, well, and, and sort of the disingenuous part is that- The, the whole thing is disingenuous. Well, one of the disingenuous <laughs> parts is that the Texas Originals and the other people involved in Teacup have the ability to adjust those regulations, but they don't want to because they don't want other companies to come into it. It's it's an anti-competitive market. It's literally a state-sanctioned monopoly run within DPS. He's not asking to expand teacup. He's asking to kill our side of the industry. Not kill, appropriate. Appropriate, yes. Patients either must wait to be put on a delivery schedule or drive up to two to three hours from their house to go far. So how is the, why is this functional? Why are you making people drive three hours to get gummies so they can go to sleep? You know, sometimes you watch a movie, like in the theater or at home, and the movie sucks. And at some point through the movie, 
maybe 15 minutes in or something like that, you're like, God, when they were in post, when they were in the editing room, did not did no one say, wow, this thing is not gonna make any money. We should kill it right now. We should just get out no, but that's and the goal. call it that's a day. That's the goal. This, this is set up so, this com so nobody can do it. It's so cost prohibitive. Nobody else can do it. They control the entire market. But the only and way they can do it is if we don't exist. Yeah, that we, well, we're what the fly. What kind of business plan is that? Well, we're the fly in the ointment. They didn't count on the hemp industry. This this was unexpected, right? From, from their standpoint. I didn't getting pulled over for speeding the other day. Things happen. But this is your, this is your answer? Is to put tens of thousands of people out of work? Shut down industries? Leave people jobless? and like wondering how they're gonna feed their kids? So this is the problem with MSOs, is they represent investors and shareholders, and they're gonna do whatever it takes to make them money, whether or not it helps people or not. Two is product formats. Patients are looking for product formats that are not available to them in the, P in the CUP, but are available without restriction in the hemp industry. Wouldn't you have checked to see what customer, what patients wanted before you agreed to get into the program? Isn't still the number one method that people use medical marijuana still smoking, or no? Correct. In, in, or any in, marijuana. In medical and recreational states, the number one seller, I ask everywhere I go, the number one seller is always flour. And it's usually in a range from 60 to 75% of total sales is flour. And then the rest is split between edibles and vapes, with edibles being number two and vapes being number three. Okay, so they chose to go into an or industry. Smokables. They chose to go into an industry that doesn't allow the number one delivery format. Correct. Okay. Part of the reason Delta 8 is so... Um, attractive is that there's no 0.3% threshold on it. And because of that, they can actually sell it in an inhalable format, which you can't do with Delta 9 anywhere in the state. That's the real reason Delta 8 is so popular. That's not the real reason. The real reason is that people want it. It's accessible. Correct. And, and it's, it's, and they get it in gummies. It's affordable and, and, and it's accessible. A, exactly. Three is price comparison. While we consistently have driven medicine prices down over the last two years, it would be impossible to match rock bottom prices associated with zero regulatory burden. I guess he considers testing, labeling, packaging, and all that zero getting regulatory, a getting a license. So that's zero regulatory, getting it, yeah. Having our, having our products tested by a state agency. We have different definitions of stuff. Unfortunately, very unfortunately, due to these reasons, there is a pretty high likelihood that our medical program will not continue to exist in the coming years. It is not an economical program. The market has adjusted. Texans have spoken. They don't want to deal with the medical program. They want free access to these products in a reasonable and responsible way that's regulated and managed by the state. That's what the hemp industry in Texas is doing. And the problem and sort of why there's this big fight now is this company was set up to be a multi-billion dollar entity and a state sanctioned monopoly, and then HAMP came along and ruined the whole plan, and everybody that was gonna be a billionaire from this company is now essentially out a bunch of money. Not a billionaire. <laughs> this whole thing. I mean, they could do it in a different way, this whole and thing some of them may actually already be billionaires, but they weren't gonna be a billionaire from this company based on what, what the current situation is. This whole thing is a giant boo-hoo. Yeah, they've got they've got probably like I said probably my guess is somewhere fifty to seventy million dollars in this, um, and and essentially if this doesn't if this can't be fixed, the the single ent active entity in the Texas you know compassionate use program is going to have to cease to exist because it's not serving the purpose of what it was designed for. It's just it's just there to make people rich. So the thing about letting the market decide, the market is deciding it doesn't want your products. If they really wanted to serve more people, why wouldn't they just go start a hemp company? Excellent question. <laughs> why wouldn't they just start a hemp? I mean, he's talking about how easy it is. Why don't you? Or are you afraid of competition in the hemp market? Intoxicating hemp products do not undergo, undergo the same growing manufacturing, testing, and approval processes that the CUP requires. It, he's correct. It doesn't go through the exact same requirements, but we have our own requirements. More and it's not like they're inferior or, or people are getting products that are harming them. The, the requirements that are set in place in Texas are working. He also overlooks that the state legalized federally illegal marijuana, so they should have a higher regulatory burden. That's very true. Okay. Right now, at least 27 states have already passed regulations banning or severely restricting the sale of intoxicating hemp products. I'm gonna let you take this one. 
I'm just gonna sit back and let you talk. Recreational states have absolutely gone out of their way to ban any kind of competition, and that's the MSOs. Recreational and medical. Yeah, both. that's the MSOs leveraging legislatures in those states for them. There are many states that have regulated, not severely, right? There are some that have severely done it. But again, all you have to do is give kudos to the MSOs for doing a great job at putting businesses out of business. Mm -hmm. And I just want to point out, thank you, Governor DeSantis, my former governor, for vetoing the bill in Florida last week that was put forth by a bunch of MSOs trying to eliminate their competition yep. because they managed to get a ballot initiative on the ballot for this year that would legalize recreational marijuana. They definitely couldn't have hemp standing in their way because that's competition. And I will bet money that these same players in Florida who made that happen are now actively behind the scenes working in Texas to do something similar. Well, definitely true, Levis. However, in Texas, unfortunately, it's still legal for a teenager to buy a highly intoxicating hemp product. We have been trying trying now for multiple sessions to get an age gate passed, which means that you have to be 21 or up to purchase hemp products within Texas. When HB 1325 was passed, there was no age gate, and there has been no age gate, and we have attempted multiple times to get it. The only thing I can assume at this point is that somewhere in the legislature, they don't want to look like they're endorsing hemp products, and therefore they aren't allowing us to put an age gate, but we are going to attempt to do it again this year. Ask me how many times Texas Original reached out last session to show support for our age gate bill? How many? Zero. Why, why was Delta 9 not enough? Is it just greed and profit motivation through? There's probably. He's killing me with this. This having to ascribe nefarious intentions. I mean, listen, the only thing you can say about people is what they do or what they say. You have no idea what their motivations are. You can't speak to what's inside somebody's head. And if we take what he just said, the only thing that you can point to is that people are getting paid a salary to work in a business so they can take care of their families. Businesses are paying rents in commercial properties. They're paying taxes. So why always going right to the worst of everything? And there's something interesting that, that doesn't get brought up very often, but one of my good friends brought it up. Um, shout out to Mo and Anik with Bahama Mama and Row Peace. So they, they had a very interesting discussion with me around their leases, right? And, and let's use, for example, uh, there's, you know, there's a lot of chains in Texas that are registered as retailers that sell of the 7,000. Let's call it half of them are sort of uh, hemp-specific retail stores, right? Call it 3,500. That is 3,500 leases within the state that are personally guaranteed that if they kill, if they kill the hemp program in Texas, they're done, yeah. right? These stores, th there's... You know, there's not really another ancillary product they're going to move to that's gonna help them stay in business, right? So there's 3,500 retailers in Texas that are, are at serious risk with these guys messing with this stuff and all for one single sort of company that knew they weren't gonna make any money going into it and they're trying to capture an entire market and run a monopoly and you're gonna wipe out what's arguably probably close to this point 50,000 jobs in Texas? Yeah. And, and you know, 3,500 leases, like, just to put it into context, 3,500 commercial leases, that's a lot. I'm gonna geek out for a second. This is like uh, that Star Trek episode, you know, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few, yeah. but in Texas Originals case, it's the needs of the one outweigh the needs of the many. Literally, yeah. literally. Here's a company literally advocating to be the only player in the state, and he's asking What's him- What's more greedy than what, that? Yeah, exactly, so we're the greedy ones, but this guy is trying to be the only player in the state, and he's being asked to judge us on whether we're greedy. Yeah. If I put 0.3% in this cup, right here. I could probably put 100 milligrams of THC in that cup, if not more. That's an incredibly high dose. No, it's not. I take 100 milligrams before bed. I took 100 milligrams last night to sleep, and I'm totally fine. I talked so, to a veteran who takes 1,000 milligrams a day. Yeah, and, and this is another tactic that the marijuana industry is using against hemp, saying like, oh, this high dosing. But if you go into any recreational or medicinal market, I can buy candy bars up to 2,000 milligrams in Oklahoma, right? Now, Colorado has serving size limits and some states have something in place, but for the most part, what your dose is in cannabis largely has to do with your own body chemistry, Physiology. how long you've been doing it. There's a lot of things at play. And to some people, 100 gram, milligrams is not a lot. 
And so th I, that's that's a little bit disingenuous. I mean, if I, if I hear what this guy is saying correctly, he's saying I want to be the only one who people can get any effect from. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's how you deliver it? It forces you to digest. It. So delta H delivered differently. Therefore, you you get the. Oh my God! It's not, deli it's it's, not delivered differently. It's a THC. You take in a gummy. You can drink it. You can smoke it. You can like it's it's THC. You consume it the same way. I think the next time they get an expert witness, they might want to get somebody who actually knows about products. Well, it just a lot of it is is just not super genuine in the way that it's being described or told. And and you know I I would love you know I'll I'll be very open in the sense that I would love to sit down with Senator Perry and talk to him and and educate him on some of this stuff and. And I think, you know, he I'm going to guess that will never happen, but okay. I, I would love to. But I, my, you know, my assumption here is, you know, he comes from a, a largely prohibitionist stance. And, and he was one of the people that pushed for HB 1325 to pass. And now that a lot of these products have sort of come to fruition and the market has adapted and, and evolved and matured, he's not happy with sort of what he signed off on and where it is now. But one of the things that, that I think he's overlooking is he has done something absolutely magical and beautiful for the Texas economy. Oh my God, For a yes. lot of people. I mean, this is a multi-billion dollar industry that is arguably producing over a hundred million dollars in taxes a year to the state, providing jobs for 50,000 people. So from that perspective, I have to thank Senator Perry. He did an amazing job. And I'm, I'm, I'm bummed that he doesn't see it that way and he looks at this as sort of a, a black eye or a mark on his record, you know, and something that he's not proud of. But man, I'm, I'm actually very grateful for him for what he has done and, and, and where this has ended up. And it's beautiful. And, and it bums me out that he's not as proud of it as we are. This, whether, whether he's happy about it or not, he has inadvertently helped millions of people yeah. get relief. Yeah. Millions of people. And I mean, I don't, were... I don't think he realizes how many people in Texas, including veterans, that have been able to find sleep, relief. We're talking yeah. cancer patients, struggling. all these people that don't really have easy access to the, the Texas Compassionate Use Program are utilizing the hemp products. And, and he's the one that, that has sort of in a large way helped facilitate this. And for me, that's a huge compliment. Like, it's a happy I, accident. I couldn't, I couldn't be more grateful to him for that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Listen, my mom fell recently and I sent her some gummies. Yeah. 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 And she's a happy person. It was really entrepreneurial chemist, as you guys very you know, smartly brought up earlier. It's just a market maturing. It's not, it, it, they're trying to attribute it to like greed and, and other weird nefarious stuff. The because that's how you justify trying to wipe out an industry. The hemp market's maturing. And this is, this is something that drives me a little crazy is, you know, if you look at the farm bill, I strongly believe the farm bill was written the way it was written to help the United States go to the forefront of the world in terms of hemp. Right. And arguably, we're there now because of the farm bill. The United States is number one in the world for hemp, for research and development, for production, for manufacturing, distribution, all of it. The U.S., I'll, go, I'll put up against anybody in regards to hemp. It's not even close. And kudos to Texas, because in 2019, they mandated that you had to test the products. They were at the front of it. Yeah. They helped the industry. Texas yeah. was super proactive. There's, so this is fascinating. If you look at the marijuana market and the hemp market within Texas, there's a lot of people that will argue the medical marijuana market in Texas with the one single company is the worst in the entire country. Yeah. Most websites that list medical medicinal marijuana programs within states don't even list Texas as having a medical <laughs> marijuana program. Wrong? Yeah. Right? No, no, that's, ac that's, uh, that's, that's, that's accurate. That's accurate. Yeah. Now, on the flip side, the hemp program is widely regarded as the best in the entire country. Yeah. Why is that? Because it has there are, great regulations. There are multi-million dollar companies moving out of state every day into Texas to run hemp companies because of the regulations here. Yeah. I have multiple I have friends that have moved this year. I have zero problem calling this guy out, the, the Texas original guy, for constantly saying that this is unregulated. Yeah. Like, dude, That's you're in the state. It's absolutely. In California, there was a, actually a documentary on it for a while. When they regulated it in California, guess what happened? All the good guys went broke, the ones that were regulated, and all the bad guys filled the void plus. He's correct. So he's correct. And this is literally what we are talking wait, about wait, wait. in Texas. He's correct, but he's ascribing it to the hemp industry versus the illegal marijuana industry. Yeah. So, so he's right, but he's wrong. So look, kids, overregulation is bad. Um, overregulation on on a product will force people to go find it somewhere else. And so that's essentially what happened in California. 
California, they overregulated the marijuana market and, and the, the illicit market took off. And the illicit market in California is bigger than the legal market. Now, when I say illicit, we're talking illicit marijuana. We aren't talking hemp. There's no illicit hemp. We're talking illicit <laughs> marijuana in California is bigger than the legal ca marijuana market in California because of the regulatory burden. You gotta wonder who's giving him this information because obviously they're giving him incorrect information and he doesn't know it. There's 1,600 regulated facilities in California. I've heard 2,700 illegal ones. Thousands of unregulated Correct. in California. Correct. So, so but we're talking about marijuana. Yeah, there's no hemp in this discussion anywhere Correct. whatsoever. It factor into the equation. It's marijuana and marijuana. It's it's illegal, federally illegal marijuana and state legal marijuana versus illegal state and illegal federal. This is like upside down world. Yeah. It goes back to an all or nothing. Cuz if we if we begin to squeeze In what market is it ever all or nothing? What, why is that the choice? The only reason we're discussing all or nothing from Texas Originals' perspective is because they want to be the all and they want us to be the nothing. That's the only reason that that's the only option, because they can't stand any competition. Yeah. They can't stand people to have choice. Texas Original does not want people to make their own decisions. They want people to have to sign up to a list. They want people to have to register with the state. They want people to have be like hostages to them, and that is the reason that we're looking well, at all or nothing. It's because they're serving their shareholders and their investors. That's the best thing to happen for their shareholders and investors. Listen, I, That's how they get the highest return on their investment. I am a capitalist. I have no problem with that. And capitalism includes competition. It well, doesn't include monopolies. Not if you can eliminate it. <laughs> yeah, Every, you know what's so funny? It's like, I mean, what's the best business? The one with no competition. Government. Government. <laughs> I mean, well, technically, it's within I mean, DPS. A government-sponsored monopoly is, it, I mean, that's what we're talking about, so. That's literally what it is. That people are willing to pay for to get uh, high. I mean, that's truthfully, it's just no different than any other box. So as far as he's concerned, there is no benefit to this. It's just a vice, which is a bad thing. It's something that you need well, to be Well, that's why the medical doctors up. didn't have any medical studies. They're trying to get say it's, there's no validity. Only pe People only want to use these products to get high, but we know the difference. I talk to hundreds of customers you know, every month that are using these products to, to alleviate whatever, whatever they are, they're dealing with. I told with. you about that 60-year-old woman from the gym. Chronic pain and our gummies were the only thing that helped her. None of the prescription medicines, they made her sick, whatever. This was the only way she got any sleep. But it's interesting, from a legislative perspective, you're not supposed to impose your morals on a law. Right? We're talking about the market deciding. We're talking about something that's already legal, that the legislature did legalize. And now we're having um, morals are being brought up. It's a vice. Yeah. Not fair. My understanding is that there are no regulations around proximity to school. For the CUP, we have to. Isn't it weird that they're asking all these hemp related questions? of somebody in the marijuana space as opposed well, to asking somebody well, in the that, hemp space. This is the legislator that passed HB 1325. I'm, I'm confused why. I'm Look, confused with all respect, why. With all the respect to everybody on this panel, I, I feel like they should know or their staffers should have told them what's in HB 1325. I agree. Like I would, I would not have gone into this meeting without understanding HB 1325 and at least having read it. I agree. We get calls constantly from uh, prosecuting attorneys around the state asking these questions. And so these are questions that we're not able to answer. Okay. How, wait, what do you mean you're not able to answer it? Wait, why is he getting questions from prosecuting attorneys around the state about the location, and I'm not saying that I agree with it, but about the location of a vending machine by a school? Why would a prosecuting attorney be calling about that? Also, well, how would you not be able to answer it? Do you not know what's in 1325? Like, does, has nobody, nobody read 1325, 1325 on this panel? If we increase accessibility of the program to patients, we will see less churn from that. He's assuming that more accessibility will translate into people still wanting to pay more, right? Still wanting to be on a government list, still be tracked about what they do in their own homes on their private time, and I think that's a leap. Which state or country has the best operating medical use program? 
easiest to that, use. That's hard to say. Good uh, yeah. cost, safe. So, so I've been in a lot of the states. I think the I think the Oklahoma program, despite a lot of legislators having complaints about that, and it's the Oklahoma program is so good because the MSOs don't control it. And that's why they'll never cite it as being a good program. <laughs> but the Oklahoma program is phenomenal. It's accessible. It's affordable. People are very happy with it. They have, last count, I think they had three or 400,000 registered patients. Um, I mean, it's, it's a thriving, successful program. So, and, and the reason it is, because there's no MSOs involved. As the marijuana expert, MSO expert, et cetera, you have to wonder why he's struggling so much to answer this question probably one of the safest programs in the country. But, but which is great, we want safe, but how good is it if you can't access it? There is give and take, for sure. He should have been a politician. Uh, Senator Menendez makes some great points. Uh, he, was, he was very, very appropriate in all of his comments throughout all the hearing and all the testimonies. I wanna thank him for everything, all the questions he had and all the stuff that he said. Um, a lot of the committee was great. You know, Senator Perry has always kind of had it out for us, and I think it ties back to him being involved with 1325 and being unhappy that, that it sort of evolved into this industry the way it is. But that being said, you know, I have to compliment him, and even if it was by accident, he created one of the, one of the best thriving industries in Texas. Oh, I know. And I'm honored to be a part of it, and I would shake his hand and tell him, thank you, Ford, if I ever met him in person. Well. He'd probably <laughs> yell at me, but. And inadvertently, he helped millions of people. Yeah. And the, thing, the flip side is also true. The same person that we can thank for helping so many people will be doing a disservice to those same people by trying to eliminate this. Yeah. yeah. Um, I want to thank everybody for leaving a ton of comments on the video that we just put up, part one. Uh, if you'd like to leave a comment, if you have any questions, any comments, please feel free to comment. Cynthia and I go in there and play in the comment section and try and respond. Uh, love you guys as always. Thank you for being a part of this with us. This has been uh, a lot of fun. Cynthia and I love what we do. We're at war every day. We're fighting for the industry within Texas and largely within the country. A lot of people don't realize what happens in Texas cascades out throughout the rest of the country. So what happens with the Texas hemp industry is a really, really big deal. And that's why we take this so seriously. So we're honored to be a, a part of this. We're honored to be fighting for all of you. Thank you for allowing us to be here and serve you. And happy hunting, and we'll see you in the next video. I never want to do another video where you're wearing more bracelets than I am. I'm not letting it bang on the table. <laughs>